So we are re we are reading Hands of Light by Barbara Brennan. We are on page in chapter twenty, page number one eighty one of the book and one ninety seven of the PDF. Shimangla wants. Barbara, no, I am getting tired. This talk is too linear. Hey, Owen. That is because we are again squeezing this information into your narrow perception. Allow your perception to expand as we lead you into another realm of light. As you enter this room, see the lightness, feel the joy. Okay, so now this is again very important thing that she said that when we are in that expanded state before we manifest over here, we are operating at this level of consciousness. Now when we come here to experience the experience we are squeezing the level of perception so now if some perception which is beyond our capacity comes here we can't deal with it right so over here Barbara is telling him I can't deal with this kind of information and then uh, Heon is saying that you need to increase your level of perception right now all the stuff that we are doing in awareness today is basically to increase our level of perception that's the game that we are playing From here, I was led into what appeared to be higher and higher realms. Each realm was more magnificent than the other one before. Each was harder and harder to perceive. Each was becoming apparently thinner and of less form. My guide, Ewan, led me. So again, as soon as we go into the higher states of consciousness, the vibratory frequency starts to speed up. It becomes more subtle, right? As we come into material existence, the things start, the waves start to slow down. So if something, it's like, you know, if you take ice, it is water solidified, the, the vibratory frequency of the molecules is very low. You heat it up a bit, it becomes water, it becomes difficult to hold, right? But it, you can still see it and feel it. You heat it a little more, if it becomes water vapor, the water is still there, but now you can't perceive it. So it's becoming finer and finer as the vibratory frequency starts to get enhanced and in increase. So again, as she's going into the higher states of consciousness, it becomes subtler and subtler. We reached as high as I could perceive, at which point Huyen said, and here we stand before the door of the holy of holies where every human longs to enter. I could see my past lifetimes floating by beneath me as the wafted scent of jasmine in the night day. As each did, I could feel a pull to look back into the reality. Each time that pull felt like falling. I tried to stay with the sense of being beyond Barbara, beyond time, beyond lifetime. I try so again, what is happening over here, right? Again, when we are going into these subtler and subtler realms, we are coming closer to oneness, right? It is, it's like when we are getting into focus 15, everything, it's a state of no time, everything exists. So you can actually observe your past lives as well as your probable future lives, which you can start observing. And we are going into the higher states of consciousness now. And naturally, whenever you're connecting with something, you will be pulled towards that. You will be pulled because your focus of attention goes there and you can engage that reality, right? So that will become real for you. And then when you come back, it takes a little bit of time to come back into this reality. This is something that people experience when they are getting connected totally with that other reality. Robert Monroe also felt this when he was going in his out-of-body state. He called it locale one and locale two, etc., where he used to actually go and find himself in the body of someone else. And he is perceiving everything and doing everything with the perception of that person. But he knows that he's in some other body and he's making the actions. Right. So, like that over here, there is a pull. When we pay attention to something, we get pulled into that particular reality. I tried to reach into the door of the Holy of Holies. 
haven. It is not a matter of trying to reach. It is a matter of allowing oneself to be where one already is. There is tremendous room here. It is a state of being beyond time and space. No need to rush. This is what the soul is asking for. Okay, so now, again, trying is counterproductive in these higher states of consciousness. We have to allow, we have to start being there, right? We have to perceive it from a state of being. You cannot force anything to manifest over there. How can you attempt to do something that you don't understand, right? So the point here is allow, perceive, just be. Shift your state of being and that is what will make the connection. Not trying to make the connection. That's not what is. And then since in these expanded states, time and space get warped. They don't operate in the way that we operate it in this linear world, in this uh, uh, earth life reality. There is a big difference. There's no hurry, right? Everything is all right. And everything will happen in its own time. Again, time is not there at all, right? So everything is just happening. So there is no rush when we get into these higher states of consciousness. Then I found myself entering a door between two pores of the great sphinx. Before me sat here on a throne. Here. So, my dear, when you speak of healing, know that healing is opening the doors of perception so that one can enter into the holy of holies and be one with the creator. It is nothing more, nothing less than that. It is a process, step by step, in that direction. Enlightenment is the goal. Healing is a byproduct. So, whenever a soul comes to you for healing, no deep insight that this is what the soul is asking for. So again, when we merge with the Godhead, then everything is perfect, right? And that is what we are all striving for. So any kind of healing, any kind of growth that we are looking for is going towards that perfection. Remember that whenever someone comes to you for help or healing, their words come through their doorway of perception. Now, this is an important term. Whenever you are asking for something or you are doing something, it is always restricted to the level of perception that you are operating from. Okay, you cannot you cannot say and do things anything which is beyond your perception. So, when a healer is healing, the healer has to hear what that person is saying but get their own inference from their own level of perception. Because what the client is asking for or what the person asking for healing is asking for is operating from a limited perception. Now, if your perception is a bigger perception or a higher perception, then you can see what that client cannot see. So you must operate with your perception, not with the client's perception. It may be a narrow one or a broad one, a sore toe, a life-threatening disease, or a seeking of the truth. That which is asked comes through the doorway of perception. But that which needs to be given is simply this. It is the answer to the longing of the soul. The soul is saying, help me find my way back home. Help me find my way into the holy of holies into the peace of the ages, into the wind whispering truth through the centuries. Again, so the ultimate thing is, I want to go into that holy connection. I want to become one with the creator. That's the basic game that all of us are playing. Even in Vedanta, it's that's the perception. We want to get moksha. We want to transcend all these realities and merge with the Godhead. At this point, during the meditation, I shuddered and wept with joy. Hyoin had often told me that the meaning of Hyoin is the wind whispering truth through the centuries. Now I understood. Through the meditation, Hyoin had led me into an understanding that I and Hyoin are one. 
I could experience this with every cell of my body that I am truth whispering through the century. Even can so, so if you really look at it, right, we are all interrelated, interconnected, and we are actually part of that one. So we know it, but we don't know it, right? So the idea is that if something is coming from our deeper state of consciousness, it is coming from that oneness state. And that is what that whispering is all about. That inner conscience that we talk about is all about. Herein continued, and so here I sit, human crown of jewels, each being a truth, a known truth. So here I exist, have always existed, and will always exist beyond space and time, beyond confusion, manifest yet unmanifest, known but not known. And so sit you here also, every one of you. You simply long to know this from where you stand within your limited perception. So at the end, at the end of the day, everything just is, right? Everything exists and will continue to exist. We are limited only by the perception that we are perceiving with. That's it. Part 5. Spiritual healing. Even greater miracles than these ye shall do also. Jesus. In so what, what Jesus said was that you all are also capable of performing all these miracles. So in the Bible, there are many miracles that Jesus had performed, you know, feeding thousands of people, uh, curing people, etc., etc. And Jesus always said that when you connect with the kingdom of heaven, you connect with the kingdom of my father, you will also do this and even more, right? Again, it's a matter of that connection, getting into that perfection. Your energy field is your instrument. Now that we have a good idea of what healing is all about from the personal, human, scientific and spiritual levels, let us explore the various healing techniques I have learned throughout my years of practice. As always, healing starts at home. The first prerequisite for any healer is self-care. If you do healing and don't take care of yourself, you will probably get sick faster than in any other situation. Right. So this is very, very important. If you are not taking care of yourself, if you are not putting uh, processes in place which allow you to be in equanimity, allow you to be centered, you are going to fall sick if you are attempting to heal someone else. And your energy field, the pro I mean, the power in your energy, right? The vibratory frequencies in your energy are not higher than the person that you are attempting to heal. If you are at a low le le uh, energy level and you are attempting to heal someone, the probability is that you are going to fall sick because that energy is going to transfer to you, right? So this is extremely important. If anyone is doing healing, you must be aware of this. I, I have been kicked on the butt beautifully and very powerfully when I made this mistake. This is because healing requires a lot of work from your energy field, in addition to its importance for your own life. What I mean by this is that in addition to keeping you healthy and balanced, your field will be used as a conduit for the healing energies that are needed by others. Your field may not necessarily need the frequencies that you will be transmitting, but your field will have to transmit them anyway. In order to transmit a certain frequency required in healing, your field must vibrate in that frequency or it's harmonic. Now, this is important, right? If a client needs a particular frequency to balance their field, and you are acting as a conduit, right? You are transmuting that energy into the client. Naturally, your field is also getting affected by that energy. 
now over here he what she is, uses a word harmonic so what does harmonic imply let us say you have a string which is 1 cm long and it is playing at a particular frequency the harmonic would be 2 then 4 then 8 and then 16 so it's very much like a piano when you press one key at one end every seventh uh, string will start to vibrate because they are in harmony with each other they are harmonics of each other thus in order to give healing you will run your feel like a roller coaster you will be constantly varying its frequency of vibration you will be constantly transmitting different intensities of light this will affect you it will be good in the sense that it will speed up your own evolutionary process because changes in frequency and intensity will break your normal holding patterns and will release the blocks in your field right so if you do it properly when we are doing the healing we are associating with all these frequencies and naturally if there is a issue in your own field it will start to get unraveled but then again you have to be able to hold those frequencies your system has to be powerful enough to regulate those frequencies otherwise again it is going to affect you adversely thus in order to give healing you run your feel like a roller coaster you will be constantly varying its frequency of vibration you will be constantly transmitting different intensities of light this will affect you it will be good in the sense that it will speed up your own evolutionary process because changes in frequency and intensity will break your normal normal holding patterns and will release the blocks in your field it may deplete you if you do not keep yourself in top condition in healing you do not generate the energy you transmit but you must first raise your frequency to that needed by the patient in order to entrain the energy from the universal energy field right so what does this imply right if you start using your own energy to heal someone you are going to get depleted very very fast what we need to do actually is to make a connect with the universal energy field which is abundant there is no dearth of energy there but you need to make that proper connection you need to plug into that energy and then transmute it the other way is to go into an expanded state of consciousness and then transmute that energy from that expanded state which is what we are doing when we are using the reball right what she is talking about here is basically you are in c1 consciousness and you're connecting with that field and using your field to transmute the energy to the other person but when we are using the reball we are going into a higher state of consciousness and setting an intent there and directly transmuting it which is the reason why when we are using the reball we don't get tired we don't get affected at all but this what she is talking about is what is being done in reiki pranic healing also you are acting as a conduit and you are transmuting the energy This is called harmonic induction and takes a lot of energy and focus to do. As long as your voltage of energy is higher than the patient's, you will transmit to him. Okay, so now this becomes important, right? Your voltage, and this is something that Eileen also talks about in the biofield tuning processes, that we need to raise our voltage, right? The auric field or the energy field around us is an energy field, and it has a voltage. now if you are wanting to heal someone you need to be at a higher voltage than that person otherwise you will start getting affected this was something that maxwell k the person who invented the mind mirror also uh, figured out that when when energy is being transmuted from a healer to a healy the brain wave pattern of the healer and the healy also need to start vibrating at the same frequency otherwise the healing will not take place or when you talk about shakti pat right you give in reiki you make the symbols and all that if the vibratory frequency the brain wave uh, uh, the brain wave frequencies the pattern is not matching between the healer and the healy the transmission will not take place and he actually had people attached to the mind mirror 
and observed this. He did a lot of experiments with this. So over here, she says that your voltage must be higher than the voltage of the Healy. The healer must have a higher voltage. If, however, you try to heal when you are very tired, the voltage you are able to produce may be weaker than the patient's. Current flows from high voltage to a lower one. In this way, you could pick up negative energies of disease from your patients. So again, if you are depleted and you attempt to heal, you will start getting the issue that the client is dealing with. And this happens to a lot of healers. So we need to be very Careful when we do this. If you are very healthy, your system will just clear them by energizing them or by repelling them. If you are worn out, you may take longer to clear the low energies you pick up. If you already have a tendency towards a particular illness, you could exacerbate your own situation. So again, everyone has a propensity, right? So what do they say? It's in your genes, right? You have that marker in your genes. So there is a probability that you can get something. Now, if you're going to fiddle around with that same frequency and you have a propensity towards that particular frequency, then what is going to happen is that it will be easier for you to catch that issue that you are attempting to heal. On the other hand, if you take care of yourself, healing someone with the same particular disease that you have tendencies toward may very well help you learn to generate the frequencies needed to cure yourself. So, of course, if you are operating at a higher field of energy and you're connecting with that frequency, which can actually heal what you are also probable to get, naturally your system will also start getting healed. Right. So that's why a healer has to be very careful not to bring their own agenda into the healing. Because many times when you're triggering a particular field in the client and you're bringing in that other field which is there to rectify it, if you are not operating at a higher field of frequency or a higher voltage, you will start getting triggered off. And that's the worst thing that you can do in any kind of a healing session. Bringing your own issues into the field which will create a huge problem for your client. So you have to separate your own issues from the issues of the client when you are doing a healing. Maybe you can use examples, but if you start getting triggered off, then it's a big problem. Studies done by Hiroshi Motoyama measured the strength of a healer's and a patient's acupuncture lines before and after healing. In many cases, the healer's lines for a particular organ were low after healing. However, they recovered their original strength a few hours later. Motoyama also showed that usually the healer's heart meridian was stronger after a healing, indicating that the heart chakra was always used in healing, as will be discussed in the following chapters. So again, again, when you look at it, right, there's so many ways of energetically testing what is the level of efficiency of the healer and what is the, what is the level of efficiency of the energy field of the healy, right? And we can actually test with this. We are doing this on a regular basis when we are using the Lecker antenna to test what is the state of the axis of the healy before the session and after the session. We do it in all the sessions that we do, we check it. We can also do it before a program and after a program. And we've seen a distinct difference. We've also been doing blood tests where we take the blood of the uh, people before the workshop and after the workshop, and we see a tremendous change happening in the blood. Now, if the change doesn't take place, that means, that means the uh, program has not worked to the extent that it needed to work in that particular person again so we can actually test for all these things so over here she's testing using the meridian lines we can take aura photographs and check we can do the gdv and check we can take uh, biofield imaging and check we can use the lecker antenna to check so in awareness we've got so many means of actually testing in the following section i will discuss healing techniques for different layers of the aura present some 
examples of healings and gift techniques for self-care of the healer. Chapter 21, Preparation for Healing. Preparing the healer. In preparing to give a healing, the healer must first open and align herself with the cosmic forces. This means not only just before the healing, but in her life in general. So this is very important, right? So clarity in the mind of the healer. How are you looking at stuff? What is the perspective with, you, with, with which you are operating? What is the level of consciousness that you are operating from? These things become very, very important, right? If a, pers if a healer is operating at the lower levels of consciousness and is attempting to do a healing, it can create a huge problem for the healy because the healer will transmute their problems and issues into the healy. So clarity of the field, clarity of the attitudes of the healer become very, very important. So when you are asking for healing from someone, you must assess where the healer is operating from. It's extremely important. She must be dedicated to the truth and be meticulously honest with herself in all areas of her being. She needs the support of friends and some form of spiritual discipline or purification process. She needs teachers, both spiritual and physical. She needs to keep her own body healthy through exercise and healthy nourishment, balanced diet, including high intake of vitamins and minerals, which the body uses more of when running high energy, resting and playing. Through this nourishment, she maintains her own physical vehicle in a condition that allows her to raise her vibrations to reach up and out to the universal energy field and those spiritual healing energies that will then flow through her. She must first raise her own vibrations to connect with the healing energies before channeling can take place. So again, the healer needs to look after oneself. Right, You have to take self-care. You have to be clear with yourself before you can actually start healing. Right, Otherwise, you'll not be able to connect to the healing energies and then it can land up creating a lot of problems for you. This is something that I had experienced. I was meditating a lot at one time and I used to you know, meditate for two, three hours a day and really used to go into these expanded states. And then what happened? My traveling started. I was traveling 25 days a month and I, uh, it started happening that I couldn't find the time to do my meditation. So what started happening is that I'm letting out the energy, but I'm not refilling my own tank, right? And that led to a burnout. This is something which uh, if you're not replenishing yourself, you will burn out. Or if you have techniques to be able to maintain your resilience, this is something that we talk about in the Resilience Advantage program, that if you, there's a bell curve, right? If you, when, whenever you are faced with a challenge, you take it up and your energy grows and then you maintain that for some time. After some time, the challenge becomes too much or you've depleted yourself or that becomes boring and then you start to burn out. The idea is to be able to maintain your resilience so the bell curve doesn't go down. It maintains in a higher level. And if you can start sustaining that, then this kind of burnout will not take place. And this is what all the tools in the Resilience Advantage program, the tools that we are doing in the Monroe process, actually allow us and help us to maintain that homeostasis, right? This is, again, something that Zia talks about in Somatic Intelligence also, to maintain our center, to maintain our equanimity when we are doing the healing. This becomes very, very important. So I had burnt out. I got malaria six times in six months. And I was total washout for those six months. And then I realized that I'm not doing what I need to do to take care of myself and raise my field before going out and distributing my energy. Before starting a day of healing, it is good to do some form of physical exercise in the morning, as well as a meditation to center oneself and open the chakra. This does not have to take a long time. 30 to 45 minutes is sufficient. 
The following exercises are the ones that I find very effective. I change them periodically to suit the constantly changing needs of my energy system. So every exercise will affect you in a certain way, right? And in fact, we can actually test which exercise will work for you. Even the yoga uh, postures which are there, they affect a certain axis in your body system. So if you are need if you need strengthening of a certain axis, you need to do a certain exercise. But you know that is again a matter of testing, and most of the people really don't know about this. So they'll they'll follow a regime, but they don't know exactly which exercise they need to do. So then that becomes again an issue that you need to look at. Daily exercises for the healer to open acupuncture lines. Lie flat on your back with your arms at your sides, palms facing upwards. Move your feet slightly apart to a comfortable position. Close your eyes. Relax your whole body by focusing on each part of it, one after another. Breathe naturally. Focus on your breath and count. One in, one out. Two in, two out, and so on. For five minutes. If your mind starts to wander, bring it back to the counting. If the number is forgotten, start at one again. As your attention is kept for a few minutes on counting breaths, your mind and body are gradually relaxed. So this is very, very much like heart focused breathing that we talk about, which is the first tool that we talk about in the Resilience Advantage program. As soon as we start focusing our attention on our breath and slowing down our breath, the HRV starts to get affected. And the HRV affects the autonomous nervous system, which can, which takes care of most of what is happening in your body system. And that starts to relax, right? We get into the parasympathetic nervous system, which allows the body to relax and go into healing modalities. So we can allow the healing to take place within our body and also raise our energy field. Two. The best exercise to start the day can be done before you get out of bed. If it doesn't bother your sleeping partner, but it probably will. Lie flat on your back, spread your arms out perpendicular to your body and bring your knees up with your feet flat on the bed. Keeping your shoulders down, allow your knees to fall to the right while you roll your head to look to the left. Now, bring your knees up and let them fall to the left while you roll your head to the right. Repeat this movement until your back feels well stretched out. Right, this is a very nice exercise. There was a time when I used to actually do this. I didn't realize that she's written it here. Uh, you pull your knees this side and pull your... So it's giving a full twist to your whole body system. It's pretty effective. Joint exercises are especially good to create a smooth flow of energy in the acupuncture channels through adjustments of the joints. Since all the meridians flow through the joints, moving the joints activates the meridians. These joint exercises were developed by Hiroshi Motoyama to open the acupuncture channels. They are given in this pamphlet. In his pamphlet, The Functional Relationship Between Yoga, Asans, and Acupuncture Meridian. So again, the joints are fulcrum points. Even when we are doing biofield tuning, when we are taking the earth star, sun star out, etc., the joints are where they get normally stuck. Right. So it's very important to move the joints. So if the joints get stuck, then it can become very painful and big problem. Nowadays, many people are having frozen shoulder because we're not moving our shoulders enough. I get a lot of people complaining with uh, shoulder problems. Number three, sit erect on the floor with your legs stretched straight out in front. Place your hands on the floor beside your hips and lean backwards using your straight arms for support. Place your attention in the toes. Move only the toes of both feet. Slowly flex and extend them without moving your legs or ankles. 
Repeat 10 times. So again, what happens is that the toes, you know, toes and fingers are very, very important. Again, you've got joints over here. So when Asta was doing, uh, uh, I mean, when she, we did uh, uh, radical uh, yoga, I think she called it. Yeah. So she paid a lot of attention on the fingers. And we actually did a full program on what each finger means. And she gave affirmations, etc. for each finger, which were pretty effective. We were just talking about it before the uh, program started. And uh, Sagri and Usha ji were saying that it's pretty effective. Rem four, remain in the sitting position described above. Flex and extend your ankle joints as far as possible. Repeat 10 times. So again, stretching your ankles, stretching your legs and hands is always wonderful. Five, you are still in the sitting position given in three. Separate your legs slightly, keeping your heels in contact with the floor. Rotate your ankles 10 times in each direction. Six, still sitting in the starting position, bend and raise the right leg as much as possible at the knee, bringing the heel right un near the butter, right butter. Straighten the right leg without allowing the heel or toe to touch the ground. Repeat 10 times and do the same process with the left leg. The, so the diagrams are given in the next page, so we'll be coming to that. In the seven, in the same sitting position, hold the thigh near the trunk with both hands and rotate the lower leg in a circular motion about the knee 10 times clockwise and then 10 times counterclockwise. Repeat the same procedure with the left leg. Number eight, bend the left leg and place the left foot on the right thigh. Hold the left knee with the left hand and place the right hand on the left ankle. ankle. Gently move the bent leg up and down with the left hand, relaxing the muscles of the left leg as much as possible. Repeat the same process with the right knee. See figure 21D. Nine, sitting in the same position as an eight, <clears throat> Rotate the right knee around the right hip joint 10 times clockwise and then 10 times counterclockwise. Repeat the same process with the left knee. Then, sitting in the starting position with legs stretched out, <clears throat> raise the arms forward to shoulder height. Stretch and tense the fingers of both hands. Close the fingers over the thumbs to make a tight fist. Repeat 10 times. So you'll find that all the exercises she can rotate clockwise and then rotate counterclockwise, right? That creates a balance in the field. Maintain the position in 10 above, flex and extend the wrists. Repeat 10 times. 12, from the same position as in 10, rotate the wrist 10 times clockwise and 10 times counterclockwise. 30. Take the same position as 10. Above, stretch out the hands with the palm upwards. Bend both arms at the elbows and touch the shoulders with the fingertips. And straighten the arms again. Repeat 10 times and then perform the same exercise 10 times, but with the arms extended sideways. 14. Remaining in the same position with the fingertips in constant contact with the shoulders, lift elbows as high as possible, then lower them. Repeat 10 times. Now point elbows forward. Repeat. See figure 21. One L. One I. 15. In the same position as number 14 above, make a circular moment of movement of the elbow by rotating the shoulder joints. Do this 10 times clockwise and then 10 times counterclockwise. Make the circular movement of each elbow as large as possible, bringing the two elbows together in front of the chest. 
Once you learn these exercises, you can probably do the fingers, toes, ankles, wrist at the same time. Number 16. Now do several sit-ups, breathing out each time you sit out. A sit-up. Do at least 10 to start with. Work your way up to 20. So you know the punishments that we used to give, I mean we used to get when we were children, hold your ears and do sit-ups. It's actually very, very good for the uh, uh, the child. So these are all the exercises you can see on the screen. Of course, it's in the PDF, so you can take a printout if you like and then do the exercises. Number 17, reach over and touch your toes without bending your legs. Do this from a sitting up posture with your legs together, straight and in front of you. Do this 10 times. Now simply stay over and hold your toes without bending your knees. Do this for three minutes without getting up. 18. 